from WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odess Gillette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Brian O'Toole on February 18, 2019. Brian is the director of School of the Nations and Nations University in Guyana. He recently published a book entitled Educational Leadership, A Guyanese Perspective, which is a reflection on 40 years of effort in Guyana on a wide variety of different projects focused on education and health. He wrote the book in hopes that local people will be empowered to take an active leadership in these endeavors. Brian talks about the book and reads an excerpt in the interview. We also talk about a traumatic personal event of Brian's that occurred a few weeks prior to the interview and the learning he has found from the experience. I started the interview by asking Brian where he grew up and what was religious life like growing up. I grew up in Kent in the south of England. My mum is from Iran and my dad is from Ireland, but unfortunately it wasn't a happy match and they separated when I was maybe one or two. So some of the time we lived with my mother and some time with my father. With my father, it was very much of an Irish Catholic tradition with a little bit more on the discipline of religion, about knowing the catechism by heart rather than any love of God, certainly no appreciation of other religions. It was something that probably got quite disillusioned with by the time I was 15 or 16. And then I I won a scholarship to go to Iceland to study the literature there, and almost by accident came across the Baha'is. And it was the first time that I actually investigated for myself what the Baha'i teachings were, and was really quite astonished by it. And, and, and it was a ideal environment in which to investigate spiritual matters. It, this was about 1970. So Iceland was totally unspoiled, beautiful, you know, close to nature. So I would just sit reading literature and asking questions and found that this was... Uh, something that I was looking for, even though I didn't know I was looking for anything. You said your mother's Iranian? Yeah, so my mum comes from a a fairly long background of Baha'is. So when I was with her, I would learn about the Baha'i faith. But it was probably very much in in a Persian context that we would meet with her friends in different towns and villages in England. Most of them, the great majority, were Persian, lovely people. But I never got past the cultural aspects to really understanding what the teachings were. And it was only really in going to Iceland. And then I took a year off between school and university and traveled in India and Africa and Israel for that year. And then met Baha'is from every kind of background in deserts and tiny little villages. And it absolutely convinced me that this was um, the kind of field of service that I thought would be an exciting way to live my life. And then I was very fortunate that I signed up to go to Israel on a, on a kibbutz and by chance met with the son of one of the people who's on the Universal House of Justice, which is the world governing body for the Baha'is. He said, when I'm in Haifa, to come and stay with them. And I had a, a rough idea of what the Baha'i faith was, but nothing really in detail and he took me around to all the different pilgrimage spots and I went there with no expectations at all and very little understanding of what the central principles of the Baha'i faith really were but just found uh, definitely a sense of direction and hope and purposefulness that I suppose many of us in the 1970s growing up in England didn't have you know it was very much an age of disillusionment, certainly with established religions. And this was a a great antidote. What pulled you over the edge to actually dedicate your life to the Baha'i faith? 
unlike I suppose a lot of people, I wasn't consciously looking for anything. I I suppose I had a sense of the idealism of the 70s, all the troubles that the world was going through at that time and believing that there must be something else. Otherwise, what's the purpose in us being here at all? And then I was, I suppose, really fortunate to spend time in Israel with a little bit of time with this member who's on the Universal House of Justice who spent much of his life in Africa. And I remember him taking his son and I out for a meal one night and telling us how he envied us because in our lifetime we were going to see changes that he could never have dreamt of. And there's a man who helped to introduce thousands and thousands of people in Uganda to the Baha'i faith and in all sincerity telling two young, I don't know, 17, 18-year-olds how he wished that he would be young in our lifetime because the world was going to go through a process of tremendous change. And and I, I think that just gave me a real excitement in a belief that there was now something tangible to invest idealism and hope into. So I'm speaking with Brian O'Toole. He's the director of the School of the Nations and Nations University and is author of the book Educational Leadership. So, Brian, let's start with the school, the School of the Nations and Nations University. Where is it located? How did it get started? And what is its mission? Yeah, well, the School of Nations is in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana. I've been very fortunate to get into research in the area of disability and had traveled many, many parts of the world as a UN consultant on something that was called community-based rehabilitation. And on one trip, I went to Lome in what was then Togoland. I just went for the weekend and there was a school there that was run by a Persian Baha'i couple. And Lome was a, a really troubled rather unhappy town divided between two political factions. And I remember going into this school compound and just being amazed. It was a really an oasis of peace within that very troubled land and just saw that this young couple had created it themselves and saw children from these two rival factions playing quite happily together and then seeing them at three o'clock being collected by their different sets of parents and driven in very different directions and told not to play with each other. And I thought, well, if, if they could do it in a country that was devastated, like Togoland was at that time, then went back to Guyana, that was in April, and gathered together a, a group of friends to tell them what we wanted to do. And somehow by August, the school was open. Initially, we had, I think, five students Two of them were ours, and three were the children of the principal, so none of those five were going to pay anything. But because of the difficulties that Guyana was going through and probably still is going through, there was great receptivity that we had a political leader who was extremely authoritarian. Some probably would characterize him as one of the significant dictators of that period. Others would see him as a leading freedom fighter that took the country away from the imperial masters. He ruled for about 25 years and took the schools away from the Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians. And in fact, ours was the first private secondary school that was given permission by the government to operate because the idea was that we were going to develop a socialist country that was the real envy of the world and would get socialism right within a context of so many failed states. So it was in that context that nation started that our boys went to one of the best local public schools. And each night we would sit down and they would tell us that two or three or four teachers didn't turn up that day. And it got so discouraging that We wanted to see, well, could we do something better ourselves? So that was one motivation. And I suppose the other motivation was that for about 20 years, I'd taught at the university, taught psychology, and you taught all these beautiful flowering theories of education. Of course, education is the bedrock of the teachings of the Baha'i faith. 
the other major motivation was to see, can we put these wonderful principles that exist in the Baha'i faith, is it possible to translate them into action? And that was really why we went to Guyana in the first place 40 years ago, to be of service to the Baha'i community there. The Baha'is don't have a priesthood. There are no mullahs, no clergy, no priests, no pandits. So if a Baha'i wants to, they go to another country, engage with the Baha'i community there, and at the same time have to find employment because there's no job within the Baha'i faith. But the school grew very, very quickly. Within a year, we must have had several hundred students, some of them from very prominent families. And now is a community of almost 4,000. So it's really been blessed in many ways. And it's a very exciting development for us as we look to the future. That's a significant student body, 4,000. Yeah, well, because about 20 years ago, we started to realize that our school leavers were leaving nations and very few job opportunities, very few chances for professional development. So we very fortunately managed to develop partnerships with the University of Cambridge, University of London, University of Bedfordshire, so that we're able now to offer courses from some of the best universities in the world but at a, a price that can suit the pocket within Guyana. So, for example, there's one organization in London called the Association of Business Executives, and they run a whole series of courses in business, management, entrepreneurship. They have 230 centers all over the world, and somehow Nations Now is the second biggest of their centers in the world. So we have more than a 1,000 people doing those courses, and that's opened up all kinds of possibilities for people from very humble backgrounds because the ABE courses are very, very reasonably priced. They're internationally recognized. The pass rate is very high. And one of the major foci that we have now is on entrepreneurship because you know, we could do whatever we can to develop people to find jobs, but there are hardly any jobs available. So the focus now is on seeing if they can start small little enterprises on their own. And that started to work with some people from very, very humble backgrounds. What's the relationship now with the school and the government? In one sense, complex, because Guyana officially still is a socialist cooperative republic. So the philosophy is very much of a social ethic and the idea that education for all. But at the same time, every year for the past 20 years, we've had at least 25% of the cabinet would send their own children to our school. Recently, the grandson of the president of Guyana attended nations, did extremely well, went off to one of the best universities. It's, it's mixed. I think it's taken us a long time to be trusted. And I suppose that's not surprising for any country that comes out of a colonial legacy where people have suffered so badly. And now, after 40 years, literally thousands and thousands of people have gone through nations now because we also have an NGO called Varka that's undertaken really quite a range of socioeconomic development projects and when you total up the number of people that have gone through the literacy project, project with children with disabilities, projects on basic education, child labor, then it comes up to a percentage of the population of Guyana. So Nations is very well known. I suppose a challenge to some quarters because some of the things that we're doing, for example, in education, we have a partnership now with Cambridge University and we offer one of their very exciting programs called the Certificate in Educational Leadership. And after many, many years of trying, we have now established a partnership with the Ministry of Education, whereby they allowed us to meet with all the regional education officers of the country, these 11 regions, and we presented this certificate program to them. They're the head of education in each of the regions, and then seven of them chose to do the program themselves. And we've just finished 
introducing the program on the Venezuelan border in an area called the Northwest District, which is one of the indigenous areas, the Amerindian peoples. And 25 of the teachers there have now gone through that program. And it's been absolutely uplifting, really exciting. But at the same time, I suppose it must be a challenge because there are a number of very senior figures who are mandated within the ministry who have exactly that responsibility. It's a challenge to present it as a partnership. I think at times it's taken as a threat. That's a line that we're trying to balance. There's only one university in Guyana, that's the University of Guyana. We are now in the process of introducing eight master's programs in journalism, public health, banking and finance, project management. And I suppose it's quite a challenge to the University of Guyana because now a number of students are coming to nations that traditionally would have gone to the University of Guyana. So, yeah, I suppose it's you know, a little microcosm of the challenges of development worldwide where you know, how, how do you balance innovation with trying to work within a government system that sometimes is populated by people who are tired, very poorly paid, maybe not highly motivated. We had a, a wonderful Baha'i mentor come regularly to Guyana, Repka Murphy, who's from Ethiopia originally, and she would travel down from the States every few months to give advice and support and nurturing. And I remember her turning around to us one day to say, and, and that was several years ago, to say the harvest is yet to come. And I think that's where we're at now, that it's really a harvest time. But it's a harvest time that's got some very real challenges at the same time as well. Our challenge now is to try to navigate that and come out with the best possible solution. I'm speaking with Brian O'Toole, director of the School of the Nations and Nations University in Guyana. Brian, would you say that the School of the Nations and the Nations University is a Baha'i-inspired institution? Yeah, I would like to believe that. I mean, I think it's always difficult to quite understand what that means. I've had the chance to visit Baha'i-inspired schools in Haiti, in Macau, in Brazil, in some different parts in Africa. And our motivation in starting the school was to try to put these wonderful principles that exist within the Baha'i faith into practice and to see how can you do that if many, if not the great majority of the key players are not Baha'is. But I think that now we're into about the 22nd year of nations. Now we have a cadre of people who have really bought into that vision and have enriched it in all possible ways. And they come from Christian, Hindu, Muslim background, a few are Baha'is. But I think that core group of people are now seeing that there's a common set of values that inspire all the great manifestations and all the great religions. And there is a tremendous spirituality about the Guyanese people that we're very fortunate that Hinduism, Islam and Christianity are all very well represented here. So it's very, very easy for the people of Guyana to understand that the whole idea of progressive revelation, that different messengers have come at different times in history, and simply Baha'u'llah is the latest of these teachers. It really is quite a, a unique environment in which to work. But it's also, of course, a, a fragile environment and things are changing very fast. That Just recently, oil was discovered and in huge quantities. So the country is going through a very fast transformation. The possibility for actually transforming a whole nation is there because there's only about 700,000 people in the whole of Guyana, but also the very real possibility is that it will be another case of where oil giants come in and make tremendous profits. A tiny handful of people within the local economy benefit and the great majority stand by as spectators and just watch the gulf between the rich and poor grow very quickly and very dramatically. So I'm speaking with Brian O'Toole, director of the School of the Nations and Nations University 
in Guyana and author of the book, Educational Leadership. Now, Brian, what inspired you to write this book? Actually, I had no intention of writing a book and it never occurred to me. We've been very fortunate that we've had some very inspiring visitors come to work with us over the 20 years in short periods from overseas. One of them is Professor Roy McConkie, whose books I read as a student when I was studying educational psychology in Scotland. And he came 20 years ago or more, no, more like 30 years ago to help us with the disability project, the literacy project, youth leadership, child labor. One of those people was Professor Roy McConkie from the University of Ulster, who's an eminent psychologist. He he was one of the writers that we used to refer to when I was doing my studies in educational psychology in Scotland. And he was the one that suggested writing a book. And it started as an, a rather dry academic book. When he reviewed the early drafts, he said, no, change the whole tone of this and just make it a, a reflection examination of these different projects to look at what worked and what didn't work and see if there are any lessons to be learned for people in other countries. And and so it became a very cathartic process. I absolutely enjoyed it and then engaged a number of those different people like Dr. Shoma uh, Stout from University of Berkeley. She came and helped on the program that we worked on, on the Rupununi border by Brazil, people like Pat Cameron, an eminent educator in Canada. She helped with our literacy program. Roy himself, who worked a lot on our disability projects. So we looked at the key actors who helped to mold these different projects and got them to write reflections that illustrated what we felt were the key points, both positively and negatively. What we wanted to try to avoid was some triumphant travel through 20 or 30 years that made it look as though it was all pre-planned and without problems, and tried instead to be honest about what was achieved, but to be equally as honest about maybe why more was not achieved and why exciting innovations didn't emerge into national projects. I think that's an important thing to reflect on in terms of international development. So I'm speaking with Brian O'Toole, director of School of the Nations and Nations University, and we're speaking about the book he wrote called Educational Leadership. Brian, do you have an excerpt that you could share with us from the book? Yeah, if it's okay, what I'd like to do is to read the foreword, which is by Roy because uh, he helps to put the whole book into context. So I, I hope that can work. So this is from Roy McConkie from Ulster University in Northern Ireland. And he says, many books have been written about leadership, but few are like this one. Most are focused on leadership in business or politics with their hierarchical structures and leaders at their pinnacle. But here you read of a different kind of leadership. The focus is on leaders whose primary aim is to help communities to help themselves, not directing, managing, telling, and controlling people what to do, but listening, supporting, guiding, and encouraging ordinary men and women to make the changes they want to make. In these pages, you are given many practical examples of how this style of leadership was put into practice in what many would consider to be impoverished communities in one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. The success stories recounted here testify to the effectiveness of this approach, although Brian O'Toole would rightly give the credit to the people of Guyana, because they were the ones who turned despair into hope. The word educational is another clue to the uniqueness of this book. This book is not just about leadership in education, although impressive examples are given of this, it is about leadership that educates. We still have much to learn how best to help people acquire new knowledge and skills, especially men and women living in urban township and rural villages who have limited opportunities for learning. This book provides many examples of educational initiatives 
focused on disability, early child development, literacy, health promotion and social problems. The approaches used contrast markedly with those found in most schools and colleges. The learning was based around practical application of knowledge, the provision of culturally appropriate resource materials, such as locally produced video programs, and training people to become trainers of others in their community. The educational leadership promoted in Guyana brings to life Nelson Mandela's assertion that education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. Inevitably, Brian and his colleagues had to be selective in the programs they established. They wisely chose to focus on children, youth and young adults, because the future of every nation depends on them. Yet often development programs are driven by adults and their priorities. The present day needs of children are frequently overlooked. But as Mahatma Gandhi observed, if we are to reach real peace in the world, we have to begin with children. Peace to grow and develop free from illness or disability. The peace of having the best education going and the peace that comes from a community that is confident and concerned for all its members. Guyana has shown that this is possible, even if it was only for some rather than most youth. There is another dimension to leadership described in this book that is worth highlighting, namely that it's rooted in moral principles and values. As Martin Luther King wisely observed, education without morals is like a ship without a compass, merely wandering nowhere. Brian came to Guyana with strong personal convictions and he makes no apology for basing his work on them, nor should he. Over the 40 or more years he has spent in his adopted country, these values have been confirmed and strengthened through sharing his life and faith with the many thousands of people who have been involved in the programs, and you read about that in this book. Hence, we might extend King's analogy to say that morals are also the engine that brings the ship speedily to port. It has been my privilege to visit Guyana many times over 20 years and experienced at first hand the various programs that Brian instigated. It was an adventure in more ways than one as we rode in bullet carts, speedboats and car ferries, which were long past their sell-by date, to visit remote coastal and inland villages. However, these inconveniences were soon forgotten as I heard from enthusiastic participants about the programs and saw the difference they were making to people's lives. Of course, their journey was not all smooth sailing, Jealousies, competing priorities, personnel shortages and lack of funds had to be managed as they really could be avoided. Yet through this book, the insights gained from Guyana are now available to a wider leadership nationally and globally. Robert Frost, the American poet, imagines in a poem two roads diverging in a wood and by choosing to take the less travel road can make all the difference. It takes both bravery and bravado to take a less travel road. Two attributes that are the hallmark of Brian O'Toole, and this book is testimony that it did make all the difference. I suspect, though many readers, myself included, will be left pondering if we would make the same choice, even knowing of the difference it can make. I hope you do. We're listening to Brian O'Toole read the foreword written by a colleague of the book, Educational Leadership, which Brian wrote. And Brian is the director of the School of the Nations and the Nations University. Brian, recently you were a victim of a very unfortunate incident, which was traumatic and maybe after reflection may have provided some societal insights as a result of the incident. Would you mind describing for folks what happened to you and what your reflections are on that? Yes. Um, three weeks ago yesterday, I returned to my home at about 10 o'clock at night. I just about to open the main door of my house. Someone jumped out from behind me about five feet away, shot me three times, one bullet missed, one bullet went in and out of my right arm and hand, 
And unfortunately, the third one shattered a bone in my arm and burst an artery. Fortunately, one of the same people that I spoke about earlier just happened to be staying with us for a week. He's a, a distinguished doctor. So he was inside the house and he managed to control some of the bleeding, although the whole room was covered in blood. We waited for 40 minutes for an ambulance that never came. Got to one of the local hospitals. They did two operations, initially to try to save the left hand because it was totally dead. And now I'm in New York to have another operation on Friday to try to see if it's possible to reattach an artery from my leg into the arm. We've had now three weeks to try to understand it. It clearly was not a robbery. When the guy shot me, he jumped in the air and in a kind of bizarre way that I remember thinking at the time, oh, this is some silly prank of someone who's been sent to scare us. It was preceded by us expelling a student. We had clear evidence that he was dealing in drugs. So we spent quite a bit of time to make sure that we were accurate and not making unfound allegations. And we found three different clear sources of of evidence, called his father in, showed him the evidence. Uh, Rather than contesting the evidence, he pleaded for mercy. And we felt, obviously, no place for someone selling drugs. So I don't know if that's related. But then a group of students came together to defend him. And without any investigation of the facts at all, chose to go on social media and say it was unfair, that he was dismissed, he should be given a second chance, and some really naive and foolish comments. But then, unfortunately, a student who had left Guyana years ago who lives in in Florida, then took up the cause and changed schoolboy rantings into very dangerous threats. He threatened to blow up the school. He posted a gun and chemicals and put the fear of God into hundreds and hundreds of people. And in fact, the very night that I was shot, because of these threats that were on social media, At three hours' notice, we had 400 parents come into Nations to discuss it and to assure them what we're doing to take this horrible threat seriously, only to go home after what was a wonderful meeting. It was was like, what are we going to do as a community? So then came home and, unfortunately was shot by this sad little individual. So in that three weeks, all kinds of allegations have come up on social media. And you know, the more I see of social media, the more I see this is one powerful force for good and incredible opportunity for such terrible things to be said. So now allegations have been made that are pointing the finger at certain people some children of very, very prominent people within the country. It took three weeks before the police made a statement. I just saw the statement a few hours ago, and there's some very big inaccuracies in their statement because the hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people, are really worried that it's taken so long for any statement to be made and In the process, other threats have been made against several other schools and to the University of Guyana. Who knows? We've spent the last three weeks trying to reflect on it. Something like this has really never happened in Guyana. It's been on the front pages of the newspaper now for the past three weeks. We've had issues of violence, drug-related, like so many countries. But I can't remember any situation like this where somebody has been targeted, clearly, who is not involved in drugs. So we've been trying to understand it and trying to get to grips with it. And 
balancing navigating the incredible challenge of the insurance companies in America and that's been as big a challenge as uh, as anything so that's been one challenge the second one has been to implement thousands and thousands of dollars worth of security into our school to balance making it a safe place with making sure that it's not a police state at the school that puts the fear of god into three year olds and then the third challenge trying to work with the police to investigate one of the strong leads that came up was that a dark group has developed who have got deeply involved in video games particularly Fortnite and when one of my students actually showed me I'd never heard of Fortnite as soon as I came to New York my 7 year old grandson knew all about Fortnite and we went out for dinner with his friends and all his friends knew about Fortnite and he showed me a clip of the film and exactly the dance that is done by the killer was the dance that the guy did when he shot me people can disagree with that but i know for a fact that's what i saw at the time i thought it was absolutely bizarre and ridiculous yeah it just makes me wonder that how in god's name can we promote entertainment that takes people into such a dangerous dark world when one of my friends in england heard about it he sent me a report from one of the top english newspapers about exactly the same fortnite video games just saying that how they are really fearful of it in english schools because it's creating violence bullying this is the breakdown of the old world order as i see it and the thing that amazes me amongst our parents not in guyana but across the world is how we can give free reign to something that is so dangerous and something that mankind has never experienced before you know that these kids are absolutely immersed in it and have no idea of what reality so the the story i was told maybe it's totally unrelated is that a number of kids compete in this and then either the winner or the loser has to go and kill someone so in the game of course they blow someone up but if you don't know the difference between reality and fantasy then you go and blow someone else up so maybe it's pure coincidence i personally don't think so and really you know, it's up to the police to investigate so what we heard and again we don't know if it's true was that the fbi investigated the threats because they came from someone living in florida we heard that the fbi did indeed investigate him so i don't know the frustration of the past 3 weeks has been wondering if justice is being done it's been particularly difficult for my wife because i had to come to america to get the treatment that guyana doesn't have the doctors were very very good they did whatever they can with their technology but they were very frank to say that they can't deal with a severed artery and so she was left with creating a safer environment for thousands of people and at the same time considering her own safety considering the the justice of the system that uh, thousands and thousands of us are living in so i'm speaking with Brian O'Toole who is the director of the School of the Nations and Nations University Brian I think you described the Baha'i perspective of this old world order that it has to collapse simply because it's based on principles that are not sustainable for world unity and it's like social media as you said can be a vehicle of good but it can also be a a huge vehicle for divisiveness it's an antithesis to the world embracing vision of the Baha'i faith Yeah. And so when you go back have you thought about how this unfortunate incident that hit you so personally how that will impact what you do when you go back to Guyana? Yeah, Warren, I think I mean fortunately about 
two years ago, we implemented a program at Nations to try to see if now that the foundation is established, you know, there are thousands of students, they get very good exam results, we're producing lawyers, we've got 800 people doing MBA programs with the University in England. But now the desire was to focus really on developing what a Baha'i model of education might look like. So two years ago, we started introducing training in moral and, and spiritual transformation using what we call the Ruhi materials. We found a number of the 12th graders really receptive to these ideas. We have had a long-standing partnership with Nancy Campbell Academy in Stratford that's run by Gordon Naylor, who was a long-time Baha'i pioneer in Guyana at the same time we arrived. So we lived in the same community for many years under very difficult conditions. He went back to Canada, established really a visionary school. So a number of our students have visited. He gave scholarships to four of them recently to go up there and study. And he has brought teams down to Guyana to work with our 12th graders. And now every Saturday, the 12th graders act as mentors to youth age 11, 12, 13, 14, to look also at a number of spiritual books that draws inspiration really from the great traditions of all the religions and to look at why we're here, what we're doing with our lives, how our lives can be something of distinction. An integral part of that program is art and music and drama and sports. The number of 12th graders who are involved in it is growing. And just today, we organized a Skype with over 100 of our students who are in the 12th grade, just to say that this is our challenge now to change the discourse that Pam and I have had 650 messages from literally all over the world. Most, of course, from Guyana and many of the ones in Guyana talking about finding the guy and or the girl and getting justice and all these kind of things. But then there's a small group of people who are trying to change that discussion and to say, yeah, we can find the person, we can lock them up for 20 years, but maybe that gives some satisfaction to a few people, but certainly it's not the solution. You know, the solution is to look and see and you know, how does someone become so sad, so isolated, so disillusioned, so unhappy. Even in the posts that he made, he said that you know, he'd been ignored for too long and now he's going to show us about why we have to pay attention to him. So I'm actually really excited and moved by this challenge. And a number of people have now come to assist. The wife of the Deputy British High Commissioner is a professional actress, and she's come in to say she wants to put on a play with the children. So she comes in every Saturday. Parents from other schools have now approached us to say, they want their children to be exposed to this. And now we've decided on the Saturday mornings to have children's classes for the younger kids to get an appreciation of how do we develop the nobility in our lives and how do we draw inspiration from all the great religious traditions of the past to really create a new model of education. And that was our hope 20 years ago, but it took us a long time to get to the stage where the foundation is strong enough that people will see that this is the natural progression from all the ideas that we've worked on for more than two decades. And hopefully many people will get involved and you know, there's no pretense that this is the solution, but at least it's concrete action to move away from despair and agony and fear, which is what this sad individual or individuals have managed to create and the confusion and agony that they've caused many people can perhaps be sublimated now into something that could be very far reaching indeed. And I feel very, very optimistic about that and excited by that challenge. 
So I'm speaking with Brian O'Toole, director of the School of the Nations and Nations University and author of the book, Educational Leadership. Brian, I want to thank you so much for sharing your work with us in Guyana. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Brian O'Toole, director of School of the Nations and Nations University in Guyana, and author of the book, Educational Leadership, A Guyanese Perspective. You can find this interview and other interviews on abahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel, A Baha'i Perspective. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes by searching for A Baha'i Perspective. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. up the mountain she had a long hard climb she didn't stop to rest herself she didn't take her time she wrapped her cloak of sorrow long and black around her tight as upward steadily she climbed advancing Along the way But some 
somewhere Through her loneliness she heard the eagle cry And lift her heart in joy A soaring circles in the sky The photograph I see Comes alive so easily And tells me of a life That was so pure He would never turn Away from anyone And the love in his eyes Is so real Suffered all his life to show us how to be free. He could always love his enemy. And through the worst of trials, he could always smile and lift the heart of every friend up so high. Wash away his fear for a while He could understand the secrets we defend And make it feel that living was worthwhile
This is WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio station, streaming at www.valleyfreeradio.org.